<laughs> I better be. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks, brother, for being here to share your teaching with hey, us. Hey, thanks for you. Um, can we call you Phoebe now? You're kind of <laughs> like the Phoebe of this place. You're pretty amazing. <laughs> right. Are we not thankful for Mike and his faithful service? So thank you. If you have your uh, Bibles, turn to Exodus 20. I'm going to read the first three verses. We are in the second week of a sermon series on the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, verses 1 through uh, 3, sound a little something like this. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. One of our deepest human lo uh, longings that I believe is for the longing of freedom. And freedom really has two components to it. I believe our longings is that we long for freedom from something. Freedom from oppression. Freedom from insecurity. Freedom from meaninglessness. Freedom from the mundane. But we also long for freedom to something. Freedom to liberty. Freedom to security. Freedom to purpose. Freedom to meaning. And today is... June 6th, a big day, not a big day just because it's Andrew Lamont, my JV coach's 60th birthday, happy birthday Andrew, not a big day because June 6th, 1964, my parents got married and are still married, so happy 57th wedding anniversary to my folks in Wisconsin eating cheese curds right now. <laughs> But it's a big day in remembering June 6, 1944. For Western civilization, and for that matter, world history hung in the balance. Because June 6, we know that from our culture, we call that D-Day. It was the day of what we could say was the beginning of the end. It was the day in which the beginning of the end of freedom from being enslaved by Nazi occupation, Nazi savagery, Nazi butchery, Nazi demonic racial ideologies, commenced. Sure, there had been lots of stuff before that, but the launching of the Normandy invasions was also bringing us freedom to something, to political, social, economic safety, security, and stability. And for the follower of Christ, I believe that the cross could be considered our D-Day. It was the day of the beginning of the end, the day of Christ's invasion into the kingdom of darkness. It's when freedom from the ultimate effects of sin and death began and freedom to live in grace and mercy and to live a life of love with confidence and joy in a personal relationship and in service to the creator and holder and savior of the world the empty tomb the resurrection of jesus sealed the work of the d-day of the cross, demonstrating that the liberating power of the cross has led Christians of every generation to ask these two questions. Perhaps some of you have heard them before. How then, in light of the cross and the resurrection, how then, in light of the D-Day of the cross, shall we live? How now, in light of the D-Day of the cross, 
shall we live? How then shall we live? How now shall we live? In fact, I've put three people who have asked this or these questions for their particular generation on a slide. C.S. Lewis. I don't know if we have that slide available, but C.S. Lewis, uh, in his culture, dealing with the falling apart of modernity and then engaging World War II itself and then what life looks like in the nuclear age pushed us as believers to ask the question, how then do we now live? How now shall we live? Francis Schaeffer, who many of you may have engaged his very series of how then shall we live, asked these questions as individualism on steroids explodes throughout the Western world in the 1960s, spilling over into the 1970s and still impacting our lives today. And then finally, the third person that I put up there asked these questions in very pertinent ways for his generation. A convert to Christ coming out of the corruption of the Watergate scandal in the Nixon administration. And he literally takes the gospel to the prisons, bringing liberation and freedom to folks who are in bondage. But he too asked us in the 1980s and to the end of his life, how do we as believers now live? How then shall we live in light of D-Day of the cross and an empty tomb? And today, for what for many of us may feel like the end of a pandemic, but let me remind us, did you know, we actually have more COVID cases going on worldwide right now than we did last year? That we're experiencing more COVID deaths worldwide right now than we did last year? So though it feels like maybe the residue of COVID and the pandemic is hitting our society, it's still raging in other places and we're not out of this. So how do we, in light of a pandemic, and in light of political, racial, economic, and social upheaval in our own culture, how do we now answer these questions? How then shall we live? How now shall we live? I think the questions are all the more pertinent today. And the irony is, the answer was given long before the D-Day of the cross. In fact, the answer to how then shall we live, how now shall we live, was a critical linchpin to what, shall we call it, God's cross invasion plan. The answer was given to Moses in what we know as the first commandment. You know Moses, the prophet leader general, whose mission was to lead God's people out of economic, social, political, and racial slavery in Europe. And Moses' mission was just one of many intricate and well-coordinated, yet often startling, and especially to us, surprising missions that were part of God's well-orchestrated plan that would culminate in the D-Day of the cross. And the result would not only be a chance for ultimate people, ultimate freedom for you and me, but it would be a chance for ultimate freedom for all nations, peoples of all nations, and bringing a culmination to another operation. Shall we call it Operation Abraham? Yet for many of us, hearing the first commandment, have no other gods before me, simply gets added to a list of religious do's and don'ts that result not in a vibrant faith, a personal relationship with the God of the universe, but it results in us as what Mark addressed last week in his sermon. It results in a crippling religious rhythm in which we just simply try harder. Trying harder to please God, to earn the unattainable, instead of receiving his gift of real, lasting, and permanent freedom. And this, in turn, 
this trying harder distorts our view, our understanding, and ultimately our relationship with God. In fact, let me ask you, when you logged on to worship, when you walked in to worship, what was your view of God? What's your view of the giver of the Ten Commandments? Perhaps you see God as a, maybe a kindly grandfather. He means well, but he's not really in touch with the real world. Oh, Grandpa God, that's a nice thought not to have any gods before you, but it's just not practical. I got to pay the bill. Or do you see God as a, as a grouchy monarch demanding loyalty simply because he can? So of course he's going to his wag his finger at us and say, have no other gods before me. Probably just to cramp our style. Or maybe, and perhaps this is the most common view, is that many of us, we walk in here, we log on to worship, Viewing God, if we were to be honest, basically as a vending machine God. In fact, we take the first commandment and we say, okay, God, you tell me to have no other gods before you. So here I am at worship. I'm at church. In fact, I responded to the offering. And I do serve. So when I put my money in the plate, I do my online offering, I show up at worship, I do serve in your name. When I pull the lever, God, and now it's us wagging our finger at him, you better deliver. I've done my part, God. Do yours. How we view the giver of the commandments is going to impact how we see all the commandments, especially the first one. So let me ask you another question. Do you believe God leads a very interesting life? Do you believe God is full of joy? Do you believe God is creative enough to weave history together, to culminate in the cross as D-Day, as the beginning of the end of the kingdom of darkness? Do you believe the giver of the commandments is so full of joy to bless all the nations through Operation Abraham? This is why verse 2 of Exodus 20 is so important. Before giving the commandments, God tells his people, I am the Lord, your God. Why is this important? Because the answer is in a name. The word for the Lord, and many of you know this, the word for the Lord is that special Hebrew name, Yahweh. That personal, that profound name. That name that reveals God's identity, His nature, the name that Jewish folks won't even pronounce because it's so sacred. In fact, if you want to do something fun, okay, at least fun to me, dive into Leviticus Leviticus 19. And in Leviticus 19, you're going to see what is seemingly a hodgepodge of all sorts of of rules and regulations around domestic, household, agrarian, and sexual behaviors. And on the surface, it just seems jumbled and confusing. But 16 times, like a thread pulling all of those things together, are these two phrases. I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord. When God says, I am the Lord your God, he's saying to us, I created you. I'm giving you a part of me. I know what you need. I know how you should live within the nature that I designed for you. See, we view things like the commandments, In Leviticus 19 as rules. God views them as gifts of necessity. 
Now, two quick illustrations to drive this home. This notion of uh, how significant these, these rules are for successful living. Back in the day, I used to have a Volkswagen Rabbit. Remember those? And mine was diesel. And, and this is pre-electric car, so I, I'm going to admit, when I was getting 44 miles to the gallon, yeah, I was enjoying sharing that information to my friends. But, the, but, but they quickly reminded me, dude, you're driving a Volkswagen Rabbit. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and now I'm coming to the end of driving a 1998 Toyota 4Runner. Got well over 230,000 miles. But unlike the Rabbit, which ran on diesel, the 4Runner ran on unleaded. And it has served us well. But it served us well running on that unleaded fuel. And if I had ignored the owner's manual and did whatever I thought best, and I thought, you know what, with the rabbit, I was getting 44 miles to the gallon, so I'm going to put some diesel into the forerunner. I would have ruined that car. Its design, its nature was not to run on diesel. And when God says, I am the Lord your God, he is saying, your nature, my nature, is to be fueled by him. This is how we are designed to run. The other classic illustration which you've probably heard is that of the goldfish, right? The goldfish tries to live outside the fishbowl, it dies. But when the goldfish lives within its nature, within the water of the fishbowl. It flourishes. It can grow. It's actually living in freedom. It's, it's free to be what it was intended to be. When we encounter any of God's command, it's the right fuel for how we were designed. So in answering the question of how then shall we live how now shall we live? I believe we have to ask another foundational question. Do we want it? <laughs> Do we want that fuel? Do we want to live the way God intended for us to live, which begins, according to the first commandment, by having no other gods but him? Do we want it? Do you and I see why it's so important we have an accurate view of the giver of the commandments, especially the first? God leads an interesting, creative, joyful life that leads people to a life of freedom, living in the freedom they were intended and designed to live in. Do we want the right fuel? And this leads us to the second phrase of verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. As we go through the commandments and especially engage this first command, we have to constantly remind each other and remind ourselves, grace comes before the command. Grace comes before before the commands. God has already, catch it in this verse, he's already led his people out of slavery. The people don't have to obey God to gain their freedom. They already have it. There's no need to try harder to gain God's favor. He's already given them unmerited favor. How then, in light of this unmerited favor, shall we live? How now, in the light of freedom, shall we live? We live in response to God's liberation, not in search of it. We live as freed persons, not as bound prisoners. And I believe the greatest illustration to try to get this concept comes from the great 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon. You've probably heard this illustration. He, he, he talks about a king and a carrot. And in, in this kingdom, there was a gardener. And, and he was an amazing gardener. 
And one of the things he grew is carrots. And this gardener heard the king was coming to his village. And so out of gratitude for the safety, the security, the flourishing that took place under this king's rule, this gardener got his biggest, his best carrot. And when the king ar arrived in town, in their village, he presented it as a gift to the king. Seeing it, moved, the king says to the gardener, you're an amazing gardener, what a gift. Here's another acre, keep it going. And one of the noblemen in the king's court sees this and goes, not unlike we do, right? Vending machine God, I like this. What if I give my best horse, then what will I get? And sure enough, that nobleman gave that king his best horse. And the king simply said, thank you. And off he went. That nobleman, disgruntled, that king so wise, understood how disgruntled he was, simply turned to the man, turned to that nobleman and said, that gardener gave me a carrot. But you gave yourself a horse. That gardener gave me a carrot, but you gave yourself a horse. The point of the Ten Commandments is for you and I to give a carrot. I love this illustration because it's two people doing the same thing. They're giving. But look at the heart. One gives out a gratitude and joy. The other thinks he's serving a vending machine king, gives to get back. How then shall we live? How now shall we live? God is trying to get us to give a carrot. Love back in response to his love. Now, why would God, as we head towards the communion table, why would God, I don't know if you've ever thought about this in the context of the first commandment, why would he say to people, he's just delivered from slavery, have no other gods before me? Why would God tell people who were politically, racially, socially, economically enslaved, but now freed, to have no other gods? He tells them, I believe, in part because enslavement is deeper than politics, race, culture, or economics. In fact, the heart of the matter, pun intended, is the heart. Just like the nobleman giving a horse, our heart gravitates towards putting ourselves in enslavement. Our heart longs for freedom. And our heart longs for a God at the same time. And the painful irony is that we think we bring, we think what brings us freedom actually enslaves us. And what enslaves us becomes our God. And the gods that we are enslaved to, as we've said it multiple times, are good things. Those good things, as Tim Keller says, becomes ultimate things. Things like our health, our friends, our family, our work, our experiences, our children, our spouses, our retirement, our marital status, our sexuality. They're good things that we think that if I just had this, I'd be happy. Become ultimate things. I can't live without that it becomes our fuel we are filling ourselves with diesel when we take unleaded and that always always leads to breakdown and we've all experienced it the first commandment's critical 
because it recognizes our human tendency to rest in other things other than God. The first commandment's critical because it recognizes our human tendency to find security in other things than God. The first commandment's critical because it recognizes our human tendency to find our significance in other things than God. Yet, the first commandment is another example of God's grace. He is saying to us, I just brought you out of slavery. Don't put yourself back into it. I just brought you out of economic, political, racial, social slavery. Don't put yourself back into it. Don't put yourself back into some emotional slavery thinking that you can't live without this or that. Don't put yourself back into spiritual slavery where you've put something in place of me, God says. So then, how shall we really live? So then, how now shall we really live? Fortunately, our Savior gave us the answer. It's a familiar story. You can read it today in Luke 4. We call it the temptation of Christ. Luke records that Jesus, when he went into that desert for 40 days, was filled with Holy Spirit. And in the midst, we know that he was tempted with good things, things like bread, our daily sustenance. He was tempted with good things like kingdoms. Wow, what a good kingdom could do for the common good, especially if it was in Jesus' hands. <laughs> but in verse 8 of Luke 4, Jesus tells the deceiver, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It's Jesus' application of the first commandment. It's his obedience. And that takes us back to D-Day, the cross. This is the linchpin. He obeyed the first commandment when you and I, when we never could. And now his obedience of obeying the first commandment is credited to us. And this is our application as disciples of Christ. We live in this time in which we have been freed from the kingdom of darkness. We've been liberated from the eternal consequences of sin and death. And we have been filled with Holy Spirit. And yet, until Christ's return, we live with the residue of sin. We live with the residue of death. And that includes our tendency to give our heart to another. Even as followers of Christ. That includes our tendency to give our heart to something else and make it our God. Because of God's grace, by the way of the first commandment, Christ obeyed. And by having no other gods but the Father. By Holy Spirit, I'm praying that we have all been convicted in this moment of our gathering. Of us putting someone or something else in place of God. And now, by the D-Day work of the cross of Jesus Christ, we come boldly confessing to the table obeying our Savior. Not to gain God's favor, but as a response to God's grace. So as freed disciples of Jesus Christ, let's do the first commandment at the table.